Hello, this is Paul Malutnock, and we're in part two of Revelation chapter 12, and we call it Star Wars, the war in heaven and the war on earth. Let's begin with uh, verse four. This is part two. If you haven't uh, uh, listened to part one, you should do that before this one. But we're going to start here with verse four, and we'll read through verse 6. Revelation 12. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled in the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. So there was another sign seen in heaven. Notice that these are signs that are given to us. They're not literal. When it says there's a sign, that means it's not literal. But we're trying we should at least uh, try to understand what this might mean. In John, when he gives us a symbol, he makes it clear. The red dragon is clearly identified as Satan in verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. We can identify this, char this character without speculating at all. In the second sign, the true character of Satan is revealed with all the trappings removed. He is called great because of his great, vast power. He controls the nations of the world and offered them to the Lord Jesus if he would worship him. We remember that in Matthew chapter 4. Worship of himself. Well, that's Satan's ultimate goal. The kingdom of this world are his. And he controls them today. In that day, it was Rome, but he has controlled every nation. He is called Red because of the fact that he's a murderer from the beginning, as Jesus had said, and he has no regard for human life. I don't understand why so many people still serve him, but they do. Alcohol finally kills its victims. Drugs kills their victims. The worst killer today is because Satan is behind all of it. And he has no regard for human life. He's called a dragon because of his viciousness. He was originally called Lucifer, son of the morning. But he's now the epitome of evil and the depth of degradation. He is the most dangerous being in all of God's creation. He is my enemy and he is your enemy. If you're a child of God, he's your enemy. And if you're a child of God, you are at war. The reason that the beast in chapter 13 is similar to the dragon is because both, uh, both the restored Roman Empire and Antichrist are empowered and controlled by Satan. Rome, uh, through the instrumentality of both Herod and Pilate, sought to destroy the child of the woman. Seven heads suggest the perfection of wisdom, which characterized the creation of Satan, who was originally the, uh, the covering cherub. Ezekiel 28 speaks of how he was at his origin. He was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. This reveals two of the fallacies that the world has concerning Satan today. The world thinks he is ugly, uh, but he was created perfect in beauty. It's not strange that men are worshiping him when they will not have God. They certainly uh, will take him, but Satan is smart. He's clever and he's wise. You and I are no match for him at all. We will be overcome if we try to stand in our own strength against him. He's not only beautiful, but he's full of wisdom. This is the way he is presented in Scripture. Ten horns suggest the final division of the Roman Empire, which is dominated by Satan, 
and which his final efforts to rule the world. The crowns are on the horns, not on the heads, since it's delegated power from Satan. The crowns represent kingly authority and rulership. The third of the stars of heaven indicates the vast extent of the rebellion of the heaven. One third of the angelic host followed Satan to their own destruction. Now this is new. This is going to happen in this last week, the last three and a half years. Daniel makes reference to this in, in a difficult passage in Daniel 8.10, Jude 6. The dragon hates the man-child because it was predicted from the beginning that the child would be the undoing of Satan. And he said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The man-child, as we've talked about, is Christ. He's easily identified. We don't want to fall in the error of equating the child with the church. See, right now in Revelation, the church has been raptured. It's not around. We don't hear about the church, and we won't hear about it for many chapters. Who is the shepherd of all nations with a rod of iron? It's the clear-cut reference to Jesus. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, as it says in Psalms 2. In Acts 4, the persecuted Christian Christians quoted Psalms 2, identifying the one of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ will come to put down all enmity, all opposition, all rebellion on the earth. How will he do it? He will break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. And her child was caught up in heaven in, unto God in his throne, it said. This is a reference to the ascension of Christ. In the Gospels, the emphasis on the death of Christ. In the Epistles, the emphasis on the resurrection of Christ. In the book of Revelation, the emphasis is on the ascension of Christ. This, this happened after the resurrection. He walked on this earth for 40 days. And then they watched him go up into heaven, into the clouds, and it's the same way he's going to come back. And when he had spoken these things, uh, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, it said, and out of their sight. And while they looked steadily towards heaven, he went up. Behold, two men stood by in white apparel. And they said, You men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into the heavens? In the same manner, he, he was taken, he's going to come back. And that's in Acts 1. The book of Revelation is an unveiling of the ascended Christ the glorified Christ, the Christ who is coming in glory. The book of Revelation rests upon the fact of the ascension. He is the one who has been opening the seals which have brought to pass everything that has happened so far. We are told in Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and now sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And she was delivered a son, a man-child. That settles the identity of the woman. Israel is the one in view. While the church came from Jesus Christ, he, according to the flesh, came from Israel. Again, let me quote Paul, who are Israelites, of whom, as concerning the flesh of Christ, came in Roman, Romans 9. We're told in Galatians 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons made under the law. What law? It is the Mosaic law that he gave to Israel. He came made under the law because he was an Israelite. Before the nation came into existence, God said to Abraham, I am going to make you a great nation. And through that nation, I'm sending a seed, not many, but one. And that one is Christ. We have already looked at Isaiah chapter 9, which said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Us doesn't mean the United States. Although some may think so, unto us means Israel. Is, Isaiah was an Israelite and was speaking to the nation, 
He was not speaking either to the church or to the Gentiles, but to Israel. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. During the intense part of the Great Tribulation, the remnant of Israel will be protected by God. Okay. Uh, so, in summarizing this section that we just read, uh, the third of the stars in heaven represents the angels that went in rebellion with uh, Satan. Uh, this is happening uh, probably right past the midpoint of Revelation to the Great Tribulation, the midpoint of uh, Tribulation, should I say. So this is in the future. Uh, it's funny, I used to think that his tail swept the third of the heaven, and that happened a long time ago. But no, and, and we'll see why uh, it happens uh, during the Tribulation. Satan has authority, which this description reflects. God saw that, uh, John saw that God cast Satan and his angels out of heaven, so they no longer had access to God's presence. See, today, they still do. They do act out of heaven and out of the earth. The fact that Satan stood before the woman means that he proceeded to take out his vengeance on, on Israel to prevent the appearance of the Messiah. The birth of Jesus and his ascension was caught up to God are the events in view here. Jesus Christ ascended victoriously in heaven. Satan cannot persecute him there. Christ will yet rule the world, all the nations, with a shepherd's rod of iron. The emphasis on this view of Satan's op opposition to Jesus are Jesus' victory over Satan and his continuous antagonism. Since Satan could not destroy Jesus, which is Israel's son, he will turn his attention to Israel, the mother. John saw Israel as having fled into the wilderness where God protected, nourished, meant that, he was, uh, that they were fed. Now let's go to uh, verse 7. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. And he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. Michael, the archangel, as a leader of God's angelic army, he is Israel's special patron. He evidently holds high ranks among unfallen angels, as Satan does among the fallen. John saw Michael waging war with Satan and his angels, the demons. Michael had battled with Satan in the past, in Jude 9, with it we read, but in conflict in few here, he evidently takes place before the last part of the tribulation. In John's vision, satanic forces proved weaker and God threw him out of heaven. As a result of this battle, Satan will no longer have access to heaven. Here, God identifies the dragon as Satan. He called him the great dragon because he is fierce, cruel, and monstrous in nature. The title serpent of old stresses his craftiness and subtle character. The devil means accuser or slanderer. This name for the evil one would have made especially strong impact in the first century for there was a well-known and well-hated figure called the dilator, the paid informer. He made his living by accusing people before authorities. Satan means adversary. He is the one who deceives. He is being thrown down to the earth with his angels, with a third of them. Those are the evil angels. They're the demons take place towards the end of the tribulation. The conclusion harmonizes with the evidence of unusual satanic activity on earth throughout history and most of the tribulation, including heart hardening, which is described in the revelation of the great tribulation. So Revelation 12 portrays two great conflicts, one in heaven and the other one on earth. 
Though distinct, these battles are closely related. In the first conflict, we observe a clash between Satan and the archangel Michael. Michael, who has been defending God's people for millennia, will defeat the armies of Satan in heaven and cast them down to the earth. This future event will probably occur at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, as I mentioned, the same time as the rapture of the church, perhaps right after the rapture. Some ideas Satan uh, believes Satan is like the king of hell ruling over demonic servants and damned sinners, but this isn't true. In our own day, Satan has a limited access to both heaven and earth. He continually brings charges against the saints, accusing us before God in heaven for the wrongs we commit on earth. One author writes, when the concept of Satan in heaven is difficult to comprehend, it is clear that he is now the accuser of the saints. Though Satan was defeated at the first coming of Christ, his execution was delayed. It is in stages. So at this point that we talk, he is not in the lake of fire. He is still roaming. When the rapture occurs and the redeemed suddenly receive sinless, immortal bodies, all basis for accusation against the saints will be removed and Satan will have nobody to slander, even in heaven. So when Satan is cast down from heaven, then occupied by the victorious bride of Christ, a voice will cry out with the words of victory from those in heaven, but also with the words of woe for those left behind. So we have this startling revelation here that we just read. This war arose in heaven. The United Nations couldn't do anything about a war any more than they could do anything about any other war that's taken place since they came into existence. It's difficult to imagine that there's a war in heaven, but Satan still has access to heaven today. And as long as he does, there will be a problem. We're told in the book of Job, if you remember that, that Satan came with the sons of God to appear before God. He apparently had as much right as they did. He had been created the highest creation. Satan has access to God and he is un he's able to carry out a communication with God. Luke 22 tells us, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. I don't think that Satan has a Western Union telegram to God or he has telephoned him. He was able to come into the presence of God. He still has that opportunity today. And he requested that he might test this man, Simon Peter. And he was granted that permission. Now, Michael, the archangel, we're told in the book of Jude, Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, accusation but said, the Lord rebuke thee, Michael said to him. Evidently, there are other archangels, but Michael has a particular ministry with the nation Israel. Daniel 10 tells us, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. And lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. Michael is one of the chief princes. Although there are probably other archangels, Michael and Gabriel are the only ones whose name are given in Scripture. Again in Daniel we read, But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, and there is none that beholdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince, from Daniel 10. There will be a fierce struggle, a war, star war. Satan is not going to retire easily, but Michael and his angels will prevail, and Satan and his angels will be thrown out of heaven. The Lord Jesus referred to this in Luke 10. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. In Daniel 12, it says, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince. So he was called a prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never have been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. No mistake, 
This creature is called the Great Dragon, or he's marked out with a lot of detail. Fingerprints are down, are down there in Revelation because God knew that a great percentage of the preachers of this century would teach that Satan doesn't exist. And there are people who believe that today. He makes it so that you can't miss him. If your enemy can get you to think he does not exist, he'll have a tremendous advantage over you and he'll be able to get a crack at you and sweep you off your feet. Satan moved in a fresh and anew during the generation simply because the older generation did not believe in him. Now we're getting an overdose of him and he has been made a weird and wild thing as I mentioned before, but actually he's not an ugly creature by any means. He's an angel of light. He's identified as the old serpent. This takes us back to the Garden of Eden. Our Lord said he was a murderer from the beginning. The words old and beginning are synonymous. According to uh, an author, Satan is that old serpent, the one who was at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Also, he's called the devil, a name which comes from the Greek diabolos, meaning slanderer or accuser. He is so labeled in verse 10, the accuser of our brethren. This is the reason believers uh, need an advocate with the Father so that you and I have an enemy today who is not only causing us problems down here, but you'd be surprised what he says about you and me in heaven. There's nothing that you or I could say or think which does not turn in against you up in heaven. But God already knows about it. And I like to beat Satan to the draw and confess it before he gets up there to the accusation to God. The Lord Jesus is our advocate. He says, my little children, these things write I to you that you don't sin. And if any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. That's in 1 John chapter 2. He's also called Satan. That means adversary. He's the awful adversary of God and every one of God's children. We are told be sober, be vigilant, because he's about seeking whom he may devour. Man uh, that, that mentioned uh, this in a letter, he said he was in a cult. He said uh, he tried to trap me, tried to trick me. I thought I was right, and I thought everyone else, the preachers, were wrong. And when I began to study the Word of God, I realized how Satan had trapped me. Satan has a lot of people trapped today, even church members, going to churches and places that don't preach the gospel, the accurate gospel. They preach something similar to the gospel. We re need to recognize that Satan is our enemy. He does not mean we should go overboard and just dwell on Satan and demons. Finally, he's called he that deceiveth the world, the inhabited world. During the great tribulation, Satan will be able to totally deceive men. Today, he deceives only partially. Satan deceives men relative to God and the word of God. He caused Eve to distrust God. Satan deceives men relative to men. Satan makes out mankind better than he is, yet he decides, despises us. He builds us up and tells us we could become gods. How wonderful that we, would, uh, that we could be that. Satan deceives man relative to the world, the flesh, and uh, the devil. You and I think we're big enough to overcome the world the flesh and the devil, but we are not big enough to overcome any away from the Lord. Satan deceives man relative to the gospel. He does not mind a man going to church or even joining a dozen churches, but he does not want the man to be saved. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine into them. Someone said Satan is to be dreaded as a lion, more to be dreaded as a serpent, and most to be dreaded as an angel. That's where he traps the multitude today. Now I'm going to close here on part two of chapter 12 of Revelation, 
and I'll catch up with you in part three. Thank you and may God bless.